Oman, a sultanate situated between the mountains and the sea, is located at the southern Arab Peninsula. For centuries, the rich waters and fertile lands have brought great prosperity to this otherwise exclusively rural population. The people have always enjoyed nature's benefits. But in the late 1960s, this ancestral way of life was shaken. The discovery of oil propelled Oman into modern times. With black gold, the Sultanate experienced unprecedented economic and industrial development. Giving in to the temptations of oil money, fishermen, ranchers, and farmers flocked to the cities hoping for gainful employment. To stem the rural exodus, Oman distributed a portion of the oil windfall to the traditional communities. But in the 1990s, the Sultanate discovered that its oil reserves were overestimated by 40%. Government subsidies were then reduced, creating insecurities and widening social inequality. The people who drew their livelihood from the land were the first victims. Bordered on the south by Yemen and to the west by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, the Sultanate of Oman has a long-standing maritime tradition. The village of Kuriat, situated 80 kilometers south of the capital, Muscat, is a thousand-year-old fishing port. The waters here are famous for the high-quality fish. Tuna and barracudas are particularly sought after. Talib has always lived here. At the age of 40, and a fisherman like his father and grandfather before him, he continues the family tradition. The job is physically hard, and the days are long, but Talib is proud. Since his early childhood, he has seen his country change. He has seen members of his community abandon their village and their businesses. Yet, he has always refused. He wants to fight to preserve the culture, his identity, his way of life. Talib resists in hopes that one day his four children will continue in his footsteps. But today, a new battle has begun. Global warming is jeopardizing the lives of the fishermen. It is the 5th of June, 2007. The apocalypse falls on the north of Oman. Ganu, a cyclone of exceptional strength, blowing at almost 250 kilometers per hour, hits the coast. The village of Kuriat suffers its force. It was the first time that such a catastrophe had fallen upon us. On that day, I was scared, very scared. The whole world was frightened. I was worried for my family and my friends. I have never seen the elements unleash such violence. As far back as anyone can remember, no hurricane had ever hit the Gulf of Oman. When, on the 3rd of June, 2007, the weather center issued a severe storm warning, the people, unbelieving, thought it would be a simple rainfall. But two days later, a real cataclysm came. The consequences were dramatic. More than 50 people were killed, and the damages amounted to over 3 billion euros. The people were in shock. In the months following the disaster, the authorities received panic calls at the slightest sign of a violent wind. A new word was invented, gonophobia. The eye of the cyclone was 50 kilometers north of Kuriat. The 4,000 villagers were cut off from the rest of the country for three weeks. Talib, working with the emergency services, had to face the most urgent of the situations he put away his work tools. As soon as we heard them speak of Ganu, we took the boats and we moved them away from the beach. 
We brought them one by one to the village and hung them on the sides of houses. We tied them to the roads, but the boats in the port, we didn't keep an eye on them, and the cyclone destroyed them all. The sea swelled up to here. The water came both from the sea and from inside the land. Torrents of waves collided. The village of Kuriat is situated on the mouth of a wadi, a valley carved into the Arabian mountains. Because it first hit the coast, the Ganu cyclone was accompanied by torrential rains. The valleys filled at an exceptional speed, and the teeming rains inundated Talib's village. Torrents from the raging sea prevented an evacuation. Terrified and attacked from all sides, the fishing community had nowhere to hide. Water came from everywhere. Everything was covered in water. The floods came from the wadis. The water came up to here, even higher. Ganu, that was it for us. Ganu came from behind the mountains. When I saw all this water, I was nervous and I was scared, very, very scared. It was the first time I saw something like this. It was the first time it had ever happened to us. The wind had incredible strength, and the flooding, the terrible flooding. And the rains and the sea, normally so calm, had waves that reached four to five meters in height. Of course, we were scared for ourselves and for our loved ones. In a few hours, this small, peaceful village had virtually disappeared under the water. With nature's furious onslaught upon them, the people panicked. We didn't know what to do. We were lost. We went to see the sea and the state of the waves. Then we rushed back to see if our houses were flooded. Then we went once again to monitor the waves and again returned to the houses. We also went to help people. We tried digging to deviate the water. And we returned to the beach to see what was happening, to see if the waves were going to carry away the houses. We didn't stop. Deprived of water and food, Talib and his family were supplied, thankfully, by boats chartered by the government. The fisherman considers himself lucky. Living on the outskirts of the riverbed, he is one of the few whose house withstood the storm. But hundreds of people were not so lucky. The back of the village was flattened. Talib walks on the sides of the mountain, overlooking Kuriat. That's another consequence of Ganu. Here, all the housing that you see was given to the people whose houses were destroyed. They'll soon have a new house built in a better protected area. But in the meantime, to see them living like this is heartbreaking. The fishermen had to relocate to the fabricated housing, so far from the sea. Not even the farmers of the neighboring village, Mazara, move so high up in the valley. Talib sees his friend Aya regularly. Here, too, the feelings are bitter. The orange trees, lemon trees, they have all been torn. 
Look, look at the palm trees, destroyed. Water came from here, and after, it was everywhere, even above the school. In the valley, everything was underwater. Two people died in Mazara, gone. And uh, the televisions, religion, furniture, and, uh, houses, okay, everything yeah. was taken away by the floods. The loss of thousands of palm trees a month before harvest was a horrible catastrophe. Families were suddenly deprived of a long term income. It will take several years before the newly planted trees will be able to produce the 40 kilograms or more of fruit per season. Here, in the land, irrigation is graced by Aflaji, an ancestral canal system operated by the head of the village. He decides the amount of water each piece of land receives. A flagey water is brought by the rains. A few months before Ganu, the Sultanate of Oman had begun to build a dam to provide farmers with the necessary water to irrigate their land all year long. Today, it has an additional function. Bishoy Nabil is responsible for the dam of Masara. Perhaps it can happen again, because we don't know. The climate, it changes in the whole entire world, and maybe it can happen again where we have another gun in Oman. So, we have taken some measures to ensure the security of the villagers, who are behind in the village of Mazara. The decision was made by the Sultanate of Oman to increase the height of the dam by two meters. That gives us a little more security to the villagers. It gives the dam a little more power to resist such events. Since then, the dam of Masara has become a learning tool. The government has embarked on major work. Seven supplementary dams are being built in the wadis. In Kuriat, Talib starts a new workday. After Hurricane Ganu, he has had to be patient waiting three weeks for the coast to be cleaned up and for the reconstruction of the houses in his village. When he returned to the sea, he quickly became disillusioned. Beyond the physical destruction, Ganu had other effects, both devastating and unexpected. Thankfully, before Ganu, we had a lot of fish. After Ganu, the fish became less abundant. They've become difficult to find. Today, we make a maximum of 10 euros a day. Before, a long time ago, when we would go on the sea for three or four hours, we'd come back with four or even five wheelbarrows of fish. Now we stay at sea from morning till night and hardly achieve that amount. Also, we are mainly off the mark. After Ganu, the seas become more difficult. Really, very difficult. Normally, Talib fishes with his friend Amin. Today, to better their chances, they have decided to separate. With two boats, they can cover a larger area. With every day that passes, they go further from their normal fishing places. The work is long and tedious and takes place in two stages. Here, what we are doing is locating schools of sardines. These little fish will serve as bait. We go from one place to another to find some. We have to succeed in getting them into the net. And finally, thanks to the sardines, we can go and search for larger fish. With the slightest movement in the water, Amin and Talib throw their net. Despite its size, about five meters in diameter, they handle it skillfully. This gesture, repeated endlessly, is exhausting, especially when the results are so minimal. We've been at sea now for more than three hours. 
We're searching for schools of sardines, but we haven't seen very many. So we keep looking and keep searching. It's new now and we haven't seen very much. We'll have to figure out if it's worth it to stay out much longer. What should we do? With the few sardines that we have, we may be able to catch six or seven large fish, but not much more. Talib has decided to try his luck at the harbor. Fortune finally seems to smile upon him. He is able to fish a few more sardines, but the amount is not enough. Were you able to get sardines? Because we haven't had much luck. We have enough. Would you like some? Yes, thank you. Sharing among fishermen has become more than just a habit. It is a necessity, a survival mechanism to face the ever-changing sea. Thanks to the friendly gesture, Talib and Amin are going to attempt to go line fishing. This time, the friends go on the same boat to work together. They are heading out to sea. It's the most delicate stage. There is no room for error. First, they throw the sardines in the sea to attract the tuna, barracudas, and bream. A bad choice of fishing area and their efforts would be in vain. All the sardines would be lost. Afterwards, they throw the line, let it drift, and wait. They let their hands do the talking. But today, their know-how is not enough. They just don't catch many fish. Talib is not satisfied with this situation. He wants to understand. Why is the sea rebelling? He has always respected it. Why has nature endangered the livelihood of a whole community, the way of life for over a thousand years? For the past few years, Talib and his fishermen friends are the only ones to sail the waters of the Gulf of Oman. Scientists are studying the link between global warming and the Earth's oceans. Adnan Al-Azri is one of them. He is a researcher in the Department of Maritime Sciences and Fishing at the University of Sultan Kabu in Muscat, the capital. Adnan regularly takes samples of marine microorganisms. The Sultanate is creating a specific database to better understand the climatic changes in the region. Talib has learned to recognize the strange ballet of the researchers' boats. Since Ganu, I imagine you have had less fish? That's for sure. Since Ganu, things have really changed. The sea has nothing more to give. Now we have to fish for a long time and further away, and always for less fish. Ganu raises a lot of questions for which we don't yet have all the answers. We do know that the cyclone has had numerous consequences. When Ganu hit the coast, it ravaged the corals. The coral plays a large role in the fish reproduction system. It provides them with food and shelter. The corals underwent a lot of damage and the fish have disappeared. It is a particularly fragile ecosystem that has been ravaged by a storm. In certain areas of the Gulf of Oman, 99% of the reef has been destroyed. In the less affected areas, 
the coral still have not returned to their initial state. Actually, there could be a number of reasons for the lack of fish. For the past few years, we have seen events that have never occurred before. These events seem strange, like Ghanu and the frequent red tides. The red tides. These are, in fact, waves of phytoplankton that periodically sweep in and kill thousands of fish, fish which Talib could have harvested. This poses an additional problem that Talib must confront, which could perhaps last for many months. We ask ourselves if global warming is responsible, but we will not know for sure for many years to come. What is global warming? Global warming, in a nutshell, is a gas we call CO2, or carbon dioxide, which is exposed in the atmosphere by plants and cars. Actually, all our industries produce CO2. The sun's rays naturally penetrate the atmosphere, but because of CO2, they can't all escape. Some stay as prisoners, and consequently, the temperature increases, which therefore cause numerous consequences. What we are trying to learn is what the exact consequences are, and what their impact on the environment will be. I'm surprised to know that there are people like you trying to understand what has happened to us, why we experience Ganu, why we have the red algae. If we fishermen, if we see the red algae, would you like us to contact you? Yes, yes, yes. It is very important for us. If you see the red algae, you call us and we will come and get some samples. We must totally collaborate with you to move forward effectively. Thank you, Professor Adnan. I'd be delighted to help you. Adnan still has a lot to do. He goes in the water of the Gulf twice a month to collect microscopic algae. Each sample is collected from a different depth. Ultimately, this will allow scientists to accurately reflect the phytoplankton concentrations in the Gulf waters and their biological and chemical composition according to the seasons. It's then, at the University of Sultan Kabu in Muscat, that Adnan al-Azri conducts numerous manipulations of these samples for careful analysis. Um, there are a number of questions that um, um, we need to understand. Uh, for instance, what is really driving um, changes in the Arabian Sea? Is it the climate change? Is it um, uh, changes in the ocean itself? Among the paths followed by Adnan, one in particular has grabbed his attention. In the Man, or in general here in Northern Indian Ocean, we found that um, uh, the monsoon winds are really causing the difference. A change in the monsoon. The theory could explain the Ganu cyclone and the red tides, the two problems facing both the Sultanate and the fishermen of the Gulf of Oman. The scientists have known for a long time that the cyclones generally form the atmosphere conditions generated by monsoon rains in this part of the world. For the red tides, the presumption is strong. We'll be seeing a uh, change in, in pressure gradient on the land and in the ocean. And this difference in pressure is very important in driving the um, wind that we call the monsoon winds between winter and summer. Um, this is very important in this part of the world, and in, in, in especially in the Arabian Sea, uh, where we could see that winds are driving a lot of phenomena. Um, one of them is the, um, it, when the wind passes uh, along the um, coastal water, or especially in the southern part of Oman, we see that um, uh, the water is being driven away uh, by this wind, and the water which is replacing um, the warm, the warm surface water which is coming from deeper 
It's cold and very rich of uh, nutrients. Um, it comes to replace the water on the surface, and this process is what we call upwelling. We could be seeing more water in, you know, along the coast of Oman, pumping more nutrients and causing more growth of this phytoplankton and causing red tide. Like all scientists, Adnan remains cautious. Only long-term research will allow him to validate the thesis of the changing of monsoon. But for others, the changes occurring in the rainy season is a certainty. They have been living with it for a long time already. After an exhausting day, Talib and Amin discuss Talib's cousin Hassan, a camel herder, who is also grappling with the volatile climate. Do you have any news from your cousin who raises camels? Hassan? Yes, he asks of God. But he doesn't have enough water. It doesn't rain like it used to. You know, he doesn't have much left. It's hard for him, too. Hassan lives more than 1,000 kilometers south of Kuriat, in the middle of the Jabal Saman Mountains, in the province of Dofar, the south in Arabic. I remember the monsoon. For two months there was rain and it came up to here, up to this region. Frankly, when we think about it, daily life is difficult. There was less water, less rain, and therefore less pastures. I will give you an example. I remember 15 years ago, there was water for a kilometer. I set up camp. For the past 15 years, there has no longer been water and I've had to move. In this country, it's the monsoon that guides the herds. Scared that their animals would get hurt and injure themselves by slipping in mud, the camel keepers go down the mountain to the plains in the month of May before the rainy season begins. But the monsoon has changed. The dry season is longer and they must address the lack of food with high quality feed, which is expensive and hard to find. There is no longer enough in nature to feed the animals. Camels, bulls and goats are threatened with malnutrition. Ultimately, it's the quality of milk and meat that suffers. But for Hassan, just like Talib and the fish, the camel represents more than his livelihood. It is the identity of a people, his own. This animal, the camel, without it, there would be no one in this region. Not in Oman, not in the whole of Arabia. The camel helps herders and their families live. Without the camel, we cannot drink, we cannot get dressed, and we can no longer live. It's that simple. From here to Saudi Arabia, that is how our ancestors lived. In all the Arab regions on this earth, each person owes their lives to the camels. It is the flagship of the mountain. Every evening, Hassan gathers his animals so that he can watch them all night. There are many predators in the mountains. Tirelessly, Hassan is trying to raise the camels, hoping God would be more merciful.
غير المغضوب عليهم الضالين It is nearing the end of the day back in the village of Kuriat. Talib and Amin are back at the harbor. Once again, despite appearances, their catch did not meet their expectations. There, that's all I caught today. In short, like this, it's what God wants. If Talib seems fatalistic, for Amin, it's too much. Things must change. You see, this morning we left at 7 a.m. and now it's 5 p.m. Working in the sea, we know, is extremely difficult. I have made a decision. I'm going to find another job, take some tests, but while I wait, I'll have to keep fishing to survive. Eating is a must. I'm not married. I hope to find a job in the public sector, if God is willing. What we have fished does not even give us enough money to reimburse us for our petrol. We have no choice but to work. To Talib and I, we have family. A father, mother, two brothers. We have to keep fishing. We have to go. It is not the first time that Amin says that he wants to leave this job. Talib, too, is starting to ask questions. Today, the two friends prefer to keep the fish on ice and to eat them with family. Once again, Talib and Amin will not go to Kuriat's auction market. Paradoxically, despite a diminishing fish supply, the price of the fish has decreased. The competition in the market is distorted. The small fishermen are at the mercy of wholesalers who work together and fix a low price. An unfair practice rendered possible by the influx of a whole new category of fishermen. With the crisis, many Omanis attempt to supplement their income at the end of the day with fishing. They do not hesitate to sell at any cost. Talib, like every day, is preparing to join his family for dinner. It is Thursday today, which is the first day of the weekend in the Sultanate. Aya, his 30-year-old younger brother, has come to visit him. He also used to be a fisherman, but he made the decision to leave the profession. Talib recalls being shaken by his brother's choice. Now, he better understands the decision he may follow in his brother's footsteps. Fishing used to be easy in Father's Day. We went every day, every day with pleasure. I started to go with him at the age of 12. It's true, I used to go to school, but any day I had off, I would go with him. My brothers, including Talib, would also go. After that, it became more difficult. Therefore, my father encouraged me to find a job in the public sector, and thankfully I was able to get into the Oman police force. That has allowed me a fixed income and to benefit from a pension to ensure my future and of those close to me. In reality, to work for the state is an amazing opportunity. 
Aya likes to go to the beach in Kuriat. That beach represents to him a history, his life, but also a tradition that he has not been able to perpetuate. And yet, if one day, God willing, the fish come back, I will leave the police force and come back to fishing. To see the fish again. All the fishermen dream of it. When they gather to relax, the discussion returns tirelessly to their difficult lives. Recently, new stresses have emerged. There, we have to find the fish one by one. We have to constantly look. In my father's time, three or four months, and the season would be over. Yes, okay, well, it was different times then. You've seen the fishing companies? Yeah, like the one on the pier. These companies, they aren't interested in the small fish. With their nets, they catch all the fish and only keep the big ones. The small ones they throw back in the sea when they're dead. After we see them on the shore, you must have seen them. We see the result. Now, if you go into the sea, even twice a day, you don't get enough to even pay for gas. How do you expect families to live in these conditions? If the Sultanate becomes reliant on the development of the fishing industry, it is anticipating the end of the oil era. The black gold reserves decline every year. Despite everything, they weigh on the already weakening marine resources. Salih Al Shebani is a journalist and he knows the fishing communities well. We see companies together with the Omani companies, they have um, gone into the fishing industry in a bigger way. So they bring in bigger trolleys, uh, big fishing um, uh, boats here. So most of the fishing industry goes that way, where they come and fish in a big way and then s sell outside abroad uh, for a profit here. Yeah. But what you see here is that the local fishing industry is a family-owned business. Uh, if I'm a lo local fisherman, then I will struggle at the moment because uh, of the uh, uh, squeeze from the bigger uh, companies who fish by trolleys because they fish uh, in big quantity. So a local fisherman who lives locally is now a struggle. I wouldn't say that uh, the, the, the fishing industry is lost here. I would say the, the family business uh, of fishermen uh, is, is going down. The traditional fishermen face another problem, tourism. It is also linked to the country's oil industry conversion. Muscat, the capital, 80 kilometers north of Kuriat, has a large concentration of hotels that are sprouting up like mushrooms. This frantic development is eroding the coast. The consequences of, of the fishermen uh, because of tourist development, yeah, because the lands now are not available near the beaches. Yeah. They used to earn the livelihood because they are near the beaches. Yeah. They're pushed inland, uh, towards inland, towards um, 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 away from the sea. So it's difficult for them to come over here and fish here because of the transportation problem, because um, of the um, um, expenses like uh, the car, the petrol. So they, they, they are, if they, they spend more money on transport and other, other things, then uh, they're increasing the cost of, of, of their fishing uh, product here. Yeah. So the, the, the profit is being squeezed out. Harassed by the real estate pressure, the fishermen leave the suburbs. On this beach, 10 years ago, there were almost 400 fishermen. Now, only a few persistently return. As a sign of the fishermen's departure, youngsters invade the beach to play a game of soccer at night. In Kuriat, it's also at the beach where Talib, accompanied by Amin and Hanawar, have decided to spend some time. The group of friends like walking near the village mangroves. The area is peaceful, and the surroundings, although damaged by the hurricane, are still beautiful. Very soon, the tropical forest will regain its original appearance. 
Talib knows that there are teams traveling the coast restoring the mangroves in Oman. It is, as one says, a solution for the problems of climate and fishing. Bader Al Balushi works for the Ministry of the Environment and Climatic Affairs. Zona or tsunami like this, we are must be wake up and take care. If it's happen again, what we can do? And really, we don't want to wait for it. We must be found many solutions to stop it. If we wait and stop it's coming, that is really our problem. We suppose take care and we suppose to. Uh, protect ourselves from it. Like this, we must find solution how it's not come again. Bader is responsible for the huge replantation program in the mangroves of Oman. Until Ganu, the initial functions of the trees were forgotten. It's really uh, like uh, dams and they protect the village what is behind uh, the mangrove. And also it's uh, for uh, beach erosion. It's really protect the beach because when it's a uh, wave coming, very strong wave, and the mangrove there, they really close the beach and be together. That meaning is no found any erosion around where is the mangrove forest around the coast. The mangrove is a precious ecosystem that is above all a very productive habitat. At Corum, the reserve where Bader works, the mutilated marina forest is home to 194 species of birds, 64 species of fish, and 40 species of crustaceans, a gold mine for the fishermen. We found a lot of uh, the fish, they're living inside the mangrove forest, and they put the eggs inside, and after the eggs, they become big and they go out open water. Like this is like nursery of the fish. Currently, Oman possesses four nurseries dispersed in the country, two of them in Muscat. Bader follows the growth of the small plants in detail. He is present for all of the growth stages, from seeding to the transplantation. The nurseries function in an ecological manner. They use the natural cycle of the daily tidal waters to nourish the mangrove seedlings. Trucks leave Korum to repopulate the Omani coast. Laws have been created to protect the country's mangrove zones, including areas that are highly developed for tourism. Initiatives are in place to create awareness of the operation. Bader regularly has students from colleges and universities participate in the mangrove replantation. Hello, everyone. Well, right now, it's your turn. We would like you to transplant these plants so that you can visit in a few months and say, there, we planted those there. That, for example, is the learning facility of Harai. Each new mangrove forest has the name of the school who planted it. Bader, helped by his team and youngsters, has already planted 455,000 trees. Next year, he hopes to reach half a million. Bader is proud and happy. If he succeeds in protecting his country, he knows he will contribute to the fight against global warming. Mangrove forest is not factory, it's not uh, industry area. Mangrove forest is natural, and they are exploiting the oxygen for the air. Like this, we must, all the country and the world, they are taking care about the mangrove, and they're taking care also, not only the mangrove, also the uh, plantations of the forest in the world. We're not supposed to cut any trees. We must increase all the trees, we are transplanting all the trees, mangrove trees, all in the forest. This is very important. 
Like this, we here, we are really uh, in the Oman, in my Ministry of Environment and Climate Affairs, we are really pushing us, our project to going on and never stop. The absorption of CO2, the nerve of the war against global warming. In this long struggle, Oman has a head start. Geologist Jan Schruers knows the mountains of Al Hajar, situated in the north of the country, well. The people living in these valleys know they live in the middle of an ecological resource that has fascinated the international scientific community for several years. It is a real treasure which will contribute to changing the future of younger generations. These mountains are designated as the most beautiful ophiolite in the world. This collection of igneous rocks represents the former oceanic crust, and they naturally absorb CO2. Here we're sitting on a, on a belt of CO2 of 700 kilometers long and 200 kilometers wide. There's a lot of this material around. An ophiolite is, uh, is not one rock type, it's a, it's a whole collection of rocks. A mixture of rocks that seem ordinary and is usually found at the bottom of the sea. In fact, the massive rocks of Al Hajar is an ancient seafloor that was hoisted onto the continent 70 million years ago. Thanks to these mountains, it is not necessary to finance costly submarine expeditions to study the amazing properties of ophiolites. These minerals, they feel happy at home at depth of seven, eight kilometers below at very high temperatures. And when they get to the surface of the earth, as happened here, they are not happy. They, they degrade. And while they degrade, they convert in other minerals, and olefin particularly absorbs, while doing that, a lot of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And all of the white that you see around me here yeah. has already captured quite a significant amount of CO2 from the atmosphere in a natural way while weathering here at the surface of the Earth. These white rocks are calcite, a stable mineral that does not degrade with time and consequently locks in the CO2. But this phenomenon, when it does occur, is naturally slow. American researchers hope to accelerate this process. The purpose would be to isolate the polluting emissions, capturing them directly from the source to store them permanently in the ophiolites. If we could use these rocks to sequester CO2, you could look at tens of billions of tons of CO2 that could be taken from the atmosphere, and that's uh, several percent up to 10% of what, uh, what humans are currently creating. So it's really worthwhile to see what, uh, what this process could do for us. It, will, it could have a significant impact on the CO2 balance of the world. The Omani authorities have already expressed a large interest in the ophiolites, but the technique of sequestering is still far from being realized. It's not there at this moment in time, but in a number of years, Yes, we will have seen a number of uh, trial holes drilled, but that process of uh, CO2 sequestration can be a, um, a process that is commercially viable and which will actually help rather than cost too much. Tomorrow, the mountains of Al Hajar and its fabulous ophiolites will perhaps allow us to re-establish equilibrium between man and nature. In Kuriat, at the cry of the Muzin, Talib wearing the dishdasha and kuma, the traditional Omani robe and headgear, goes to the mosque. Friday is a holy day, the only day where he is not at sea. For Talib, the prayer is a moment to rely on God for a better life and to see more populated with fish. But it is equally a time to share with neighbors and family. In Kuriat, all the members of the traditional family of fishermen have the same last name, Al Sernani. Talib has reflected a lot. He loves the sea too much to leave it. But it is not his future that counts, it is his children's. They did not live in the age of gold. They only know a life where one crisis was aggravated by global warming.
I wish that soon the sea would return to what it used to be. But I also wish that my children would study, get interesting jobs, that they should have another way to earn a living, other than the sea. The Al Cernani, little by little, leave their village, their family. With each person that leaves, the tradition dies. Today, the life in a secular community slowly disappears in favor of urban life, where work and money are not subject to the whims of nature. Thank mm -hmm. you.